Hello, I'm Martin Green from the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia, and it's a great honour to be the recipient of the 2021 Japan Prize for my work that has led to low-cost, high-performance silicon solar cells. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about the work leading to that. So down the bottom of that first slide there, you can see the iconic uh, Sydney Opera House. The middle photograph shows our laboratories at the University of New South Wales. And on our right is our solar industrial research facility where we transfer technology to industry. And as you'll see, we've had quite strong contact with industry. So to explain how photovoltaics work, you've got to go back to the turn of the last century and the work of Albert Einstein in his miraculous year, uh, to 1905. Uh, Max Planck had uh, studied how light was emitted by bodies when they were heated, but Einstein looked at how light interacted with material when it was shone onto it. And uh, he was able to explain an effect that had been quite puzzling, and that was the photoelectric effect. So you shine light on a metal, and no matter how strong it is, the metal does not emit electrons. However, if you change the energy of the light or its wavelength or color, you can then get electrons emitted. And he was able to explain that somewhat unusual fact by postulating that light, when it interacted with matter, did so in the form of little particles that are now known as photons. So that was a very important uh, step forward in explaining the photovoltaic effect. That in turn, um, that insight led to the development of quantum mechanics, which Einstein was never very fond of, but um, quantum mechanics allowed you to explain the properties of materials, particularly metals, insulators, and uh, of particular importance for solar, semiconductors. So um, using quantum mechanics, you could show that there were bands of allowed energy within these materials that electrons could occupy. And a semiconductor had a very distinct property in that bands that were fully occupied by electrons were separated by vacant lands. So this is how a solar cell works. The light comes in, the individual photons in the light excite electrons within the semiconductor material from one band that is fully occupied to the next highest energy band, where they are then free to move through the material. Um, the vacant state left behind also plays a role in that it is also uh, it allows electrons to move into it, so it effectively can move through the material as well. If you uh, just uh, shone light on semiconductor, nothing too much would happen to the external observer. But if you build an asymmetry into the device, and that is generally done by what is called a PN junction or a positive-negative junction, shown there by the different colors, um, then the electrons will go off in one direction and the vacant states actually move in the opposite direction. So if you connect an electrical load between the top and the bottom of the cell, or the positive and negative regions, you'll have electric current flowing through it and electrical work done on that load. And that's your solar cell. So it's a combination. It's very much a device of the 20th century, relying on Einstein's insight into the nature of light and the resulting quantum mechanics that developed. So this is the way the solar cells are normally um, packaged and sold. You uh, connect them together. The solar cells are those thinnish blue um, devices you can see there. You connect them together in series and encapsulate them under a glass sheet to provide mechanical protection and then uh, very, various uh, polymeric layers to provide a complete sealing of the module, electrical and chemical isolation of the cells. So that's called a solar module. The really big thing that's happened in solar over this, um, over this century has been the really dramatic reductions in cost. And this graph just demonstrates this. So from the second quarter in 2008, when modules were about four US dollars per watt of peak output, the cost has reduced, the cost reduced by a factor of 24 times in the 12 years to the second quarter in 2020. 
So those modules that you can see up on the right there, they would have cost something like 1,200 US dollars each in 2008. And uh, by 2020, the price had reduced to $50. So just a dramatic change in solar, which has changed the whole perception of what you can do with solar. So over that very short period, it, solar has changed from being an expensive way of generating electricity to now being the cheapest way of generating electricity. And I'll explain how that cost reduction came about. The um, lo reducing cost has increased the uptake of solar and this just shows the total amount of solar installed, the green bars there as a function of, uh, sorry, the yellow bars there as a function of time. The blue bars represent the uptake of wind energy, which of course is the other important uh, renewable energy source that uh, is going to have a big impact in climate change mitigation. But uh, over the recent years, the solar uptake has been stronger than wind and there's now more solar installed than there is wind. So um, this graph here was done about 2018 and some of the, uh, the region down the right end of the graph represents a forecast of what was going to happen. And uh, forecast wasn't too bad for the first year, 2020. 2021, it sort of underestimated how well solar would do. And this has been quite common. The solar industry has grown quite quickly and, and uh, usually you'll find that groups attempting to estimate the growth of the industry will underestimate. So in uh, 2021, there was 190 gigawatts of solar installed. A gigawatt is roughly the output of a large nuclear or coal-fired power station. So roughly 190 equivalents of that were installed. And the total amount at the end of 2021 was 979 gigawatts. So very close to 1,000 gigawatts, where 1,000 gigawatts is, can also be called one terawatt. So 10 to the 12th uh, watts of generating capacity. So just last month, the total amount of solar installed exceeded one terawatt. Um, and that's a very important figure. So the amount installed was 190 gigawatts or about 20% of a terawatt, but that number also was growing quickly. And the fact that that is growing is quite important. And this is a really important slide. I've been using it since about 2015 when it was first published, but it just brings home a number of important points. Um, this just shows the amount of carbon dioxide being emitted globally, the back line at the top, and uh, projection into the future, the type of trajectory that we'd have to achieve to restrict temperature rise globally to less than two degrees centigrade. So you can see that we need to dramatically cut back on our carbon dioxide emissions. But the coloured regions there just sort of brought home to me just what a critical point we're at in relation to uh, keeping temperatures low in that these are the expected emissions from the four biggest emitters taking into account their best efforts to restrict their emissions. And you can see by the end of this decade that we're going to run into a very critical problem. The total emissions from these four emitters alone will use up the entire budget that's been uh, suggested that we need to adhere to to restrict the temperature rise to the two degree figure. So that was a little bit depressing at the time, but with the consequent reductions in solar, it's now looking a lot more promising. And those three arrows up on the right there, they just show the effect of installing one terawatt of solar a year, year after year for three consecutive years. The impact they would have on carbon dioxide emissions if displacing coal from electricity generation, where a lot of it is used, or oil from transport, which of course uh, oil is the main transport fuel. But you can put yourself on the right type of trajectory to, main, to keep temperature rise to a reasonable value. And this has now been appreciated by many more bodies so that you find uh, most recent um, strategies for addressing climate change include rapid uptake of solar to um, put yourself on this type of trajectory. 
So by the end of this decade, I think we'll be installing this one terawatt a year and on the right kind of trajectory to control emissions. And this is the uh, plan put forward by various bodies, including the International Energy Agency and the International um, Panel on uh, Climate Change. A little bit more to the to technology now and how that has evolved. Um, the solar cell, the silicon solar cell, was discovered by, by serendipity. Um, Russell Lowell at Bell Labs was trying to pu make some very pure silicon, but it wasn't quite as pure as he thought it was. And when he cut little slices out of the silicon um, ingot that he had made, he found that it responded to light in that one half of the device went positive in voltage and the other half went negative. And that was in fact the first demonstration of the first solar cell. So he called the, the portion of the material that went positive P-type and the type that went negative N-type. And uh, that terminology has stuck, you know, without knowing what caused these properties. But subsequent analysis at Bell Labs showed it was tiny amounts of impurity in the silicon that was causing the positive and negative type properties. In particular, an element from group three, like phosphorus, causes the N-type properties, the negative type properties, and an element from group five, like boron, causes the um, positive P-type properties. Um, but all that was discovered as a result of this serendipitous experiment by Russell Lowell. Um, so people then started thinking about what you could do with PN junctions, and Walter Shockley here won the 1956 Nobel Prize for um, conceiving, not only explaining the properties of these PN junctions, but also devising transistor structures based on them. And um, that uh, increased interest in trying to commercialize these new types of uh, electronic devices, particularly these NPN transistors. So solar cell took back a bit of a back seat for a couple of years as the industry pushed ahead with developing the uh, semiconductor applications of these PN junctions. But then uh, in 1953, late 1953, started applying some of the technology that had been developed to make transistors back to making uh, solar cells. And that was a big success. So the early devices that Russell Lowell had made were less than 1% efficient and almost immediately 4% efficient devices were made and then 6% and so on. And that caused a lot of excitement. It made front page headlines in the New York Times, a little article there about vast power of sun is trapped by um, material using sand ingredient. So a lot of excitement and you can see the family up there on the right using solar cells to do something useful. But it, the uh, cells were horrendously expensive then because the semiconductor industry was in its infancy. But fortunately, um, an application was found and that was on spacecraft. So the first, um, well, the second US satellite to be launched, uh, Vanguard 1, was launched in 1958. And, uh, you know, late in the developmental program, it was decided to put some solar cells on it, which, which, and they worked very well. So they became the preferred source of electricity generation on spacecraft um, of any duration. And uh, in particular, when the first communication satellite, Telstar 1, was launched in 1962, there was a lot of prior development in improving the performance and the reliability of the cells so that the, the, these communication satellites could be powered by them. So a very massive uh, period of development uh, in the late 50s. And a standard solar cell um, was developed that you can see in the photo there. So basically, it's just a PN junction with contacts to the back and the rear. And the top contact is the one you can see in the blue cell facing you with what I call metallized metallization fingers, um, you know, spaced apart to let the light through. Um, and uh, they stayed the standard for about a decade. So the little graph at the bottom there is just showing the way the efficiency improved very rapidly in the 50s. And uh, then in the 60s, the design stabilized. And then in the late 60s, there was this laboratory, COMSAT, the communication satellite laboratory was set up in the US, in the USA to improve the technology being used in spacecraft. And one of the things they looked at was the solar cells. And Joseph Lindmayer 
shown there, was given the job of trying to improve the performance of the space cells. And uh, he did a good job and came up with a violet cell, which was the first real efficiency improvement for about a decade. Um, and then the following year, uh, Comsat um, did an improvement. They found a way of texturing the silicon. So by etching the, the silicon uh, used in microelectronics is all one large single crystal. By etching with an etch that etches at different rates in different directions in that crystal, you can form these little pyramids. And they're you know just about exactly the same geometry as those as Giza, excepting <laughs> a lot smaller. Uh, but you can form these pyramids over the top surface and that uh, reduces the reflection. And as you can see in the graph at the bottom, gave a big jump in efficiency. So I made my first solar cell in 1971. So this was all very exciting as a, as a new entry into the field around this era. So this new structure um, was turned into a, um, although originally developed for spacecraft, was turned into a terrestrial cell. So uh, for the next uh, 40 years, most of the terrestrial cells were made with a lower cost version of the same structure. And it's only very recently that uh, technology has moved on from there. So it became the workhorse of the industry. The 70s was also the era of the oil, oil embargoes and that created um, programs to develop alternative sources of energy in the US in particular and um, a, a large solar program was set in place, but also here in Japan, the Sunshine Project and other programs like that started. So there was a lot of um, international interest in developing solar cells to um, replace oil as a source of energy um, you know, globally. And um, this flat plate solar array project in the US uh, did something really important. It produced a standardized design for the packaging of the cells which is still used today. So they did a very good job back there in the 70s in perfecting that packaging through a number of uh, bulk purchases of modules from the different manufacturers that are around there, suggestions for improving and so on. Uh, I joined the University of New South Wales in 1974 and this is me, the one with the really long black hair, neither at the moment, um, with my first PhD student. So we um, uh, didn't have many funds, but we had quite basic equipment and so on. But we were measuring um, a structure that I had been working on for my PhD. And uh, that was to replace, that was looking at replacing PN junctions by alternative um, tunneling types of structures. So tunneling was another consequence of quantum mechanics. The electrons can tunnel through materials that would normally be insulating. And uh, so we were trying to use these structures to, re to give you the electronic asymmetry that you need in a cell. So you can see some of the structures on the right, the metal insulator, semiconductor insulator, metal structure, I thought was going to be the perfect type of device for photovoltaics. And at the bottom there on the right, you can see what we were measuring. We were measuring what's called a current voltage curve. So this is just the output that the solar cell gives. So with zero voltage, you know, the one axis is showing voltage, the other is showing current. So with zero voltage, you get what's called the short circuit current. And at uh, zero current, you get what's called the open circuit voltage. And um, the power output that you get from the cell occurs somewhere along that curve between those two points. Uh, so it can be expressed as the product of the voltage, open circuit voltage, multiplied by the short circuit current, multiplied by this third parameter called the fill factor, which is less than one. So you can improve the performance of the cell by improving any of those three parameters, but with our basic facilities, we were best equipped to study the open circuit voltage and try to improve it by using some of these more innovative structures. And we had a, a lot of success. Coincidentally, um, NASA in the US started a program to improve silicon cell efficiency at the same time, and uh, they targeted vo open circuit voltage improvement as the strategy for doing that. They thought the short circuit current and fill factor were pretty much under control, time to get improved voltages. So um, they uh, funded a lot of US groups and we had a great time competing with them to see who could get the highest voltage. 
which we won quite convincingly. So you can see um, the progress at our university um, as opposed to what was happening in this NASA program. So we got way ahead in voltage, uh, very close to 700 millivolts voltage in that era by 1982. So then we started thinking, you know, how can we make a cell that uses this voltage to improve the efficiency? You know, from that former formula I showed, the product of those three terms, we've improved the voltage, we should be able to improve the efficiency. So, so we invested in the infrastructure we needed to actually improve the current and fill factor of the cell. At about the same time, I did a theoretical paper and um, just looking at the fundamental param fundamental uh, issues in determining silicon cell efficiency and found out that it was um, efficiency was limited by an intrinsic process known as Auger recombination within the cell. And I predicted back then that 25% um, efficiency was the limit that you could seek to obtain. And you might remember if you remember back the previous slide, that ComSat had obtained 17% efficiency with a cell, so 25% was a bit of an extrapolation from where the industry had got to. So that became the target for our laboratory, trying to get this 25% efficiency that my theory had predicted. Uh, and we had our first success uh, soon after. In 1983, we set the first world record in performance for more than a decade with the first 18% efficient cell. Um, and this is the small, small team at the University of New South Wales that achieved that uh, result, many of whom have gone on to do big things in the solar industry. So the chart again just sort of shows uh, the history, all the results up to that point in time had come from the US, but all those red marks actually show progress over a 30 year period. <laughs> and. Um, uh, that's where our university sort of dominated what was happening internationally. This was the structure of our 18% efficient cell. So we used uh, the tunneling ideas that we were working on in combination with PN junctions was found to give the best result. So that was the structure that did that. And um, we found that having oxide around the surfaces of the cell was really very important to, um, to improve the performance. 1983 was a big year in that we also was the year when I first drew my first diagram of what I called a passivated emitter and rear cell. Emitter just means top, so a passivated top and bottom cell. So basically we, we said, you know, we fixed up the top of the cell by these oxide layers and things. We should be doing the same to the rear. And this was the drawing I drew that, uh, that allowed us to do that. So this uh, cell acronym PERC, uh, as you'll see, become very important in, and now it's the main cell being made commercially. We also did um, work on a very closely related structure. The, the metal layers uh, reacted with the thin oxide underneath them at quite low temperatures. So we said if we want to get a high temperature version of this, we have to use a more robust material. So we investigated these structures based on polysilicon instead of metal. So tunneling MIS structures became tunneling polycrystalline silicon oxide silicon structures. And uh, that's very important too because that is a technology that is also being used commercially these days. And we got a record voltage with that structure outside of our laboratories at least. And then we pushed on slightly different structures. Um, and uh, in 1985, we made the first 20% efficient silicon cell. So that was quite a uh, big event in that um, that was like the four minute mile of photovoltaics. It was uh, a result that had been early predicted as something that would be feasible with silicon solar cells, but no one had any idea of how you might do it. And it was thought that that would be where the performance topped out at 25%. But as you can see from the results there, we went way past that. But this is the um, team that produced the first 20% efficient cell back in 1985. And all those people that have shown there, or at least uh, nearly all of them, went on to play a major role in the development of the industry and in reducing those costs, if you remember back to the graph I showed earlier. 
our uh, run of records was interrupted by a group at Stanford University led by um, Professor Dick Swanson, but they had an unusual structure where both contacts were on the rear of the device. So the sunlight is coming from the bottom in this drawing here. So our, our run of records was uh, broken by this result here, which uh, stimulated us to implement the structure I had conceived of uh, a few years earlier, the PERC structure. And once we um, had that up and going, we got ahead again and we reached our 25% um, milestone, the target that I'd set for the group way back in 1983, we reached that in 2008. So a long sustained developmental program. And that's the structure there that you can see. So we've done various tricks there to, um, to improve the voltage, current and fill factor of those devices. Um, since then, um, we, we held that 25% record for another uh, let's think another six years, but um, past uh, past that era, the companies have taken over in terms of uh, setting the performance record. So uh, SunPower is a major manufacturer now in the US, one of the two big US manufacturers of solar cells, um, but they took over the technology that's, that Stanford University had pioneered, took over many of the staff from Stanford as well with the, um, you know, the, both the uh, structure, both the junctions on the rear of the device. And you can see the progress they made. They started with efficiencies lower than Stanford had done and then build it up to also get very close to 25% efficient. And then a lot of work uh, was done by companies here in Japan. So Panasonic developed this um, uh, distinct uh, structure here known as the heterojunction cell. And um, it's very similar to the MISM structure I showed earlier. So conceptually very simple to it, although uh, the um, structure itself was conceived by a different route here in Japan. And uh, you can see the development of efficiency was very similar to that at SunPower. So it followed nearly the same trajectory. And then in 2014, our 25% record was beaten by Panasonic um, using this uh, structure. Um, by um, using heterojunctions, um, the heterojunction approach on the rear of the SunPower device, essentially. And uh, you can see the dotted line at the top is the limiting efficiency for silicon solar cells, um, very similar to the value that I deduced back in 1983 when I deduced that 25% was about where you'd get to experimentally. And uh, the record now for a silicon cell is held by another Japanese company, Kanika, uh, that was set in 2017. So that's 26.7. So the efficiency has gone up, but um, the rate of progress has slowed down. But most of the recent records have been by industrial groups like this. The days when the universities could compete are probably behind us. However, commercially, um, the PERC cell that was developed by our university has well and truly taken over, as you can see on this chart here. The um, dark blue regions that are the dominant uh, region on the graphs up to about 2017, that represents the technology that was developed at Comsat Lab in 1974, the, the, the structure using those little pyramids on the surface. So that was the main commercial product product uh, up to that period. And the maroon region there on top of it is very similar technology. And the uh, black and light blue represent uh, you know, other technologies. So completely dominated by that um, 1974's type of technology. But from 1915 onwards, you can see um, the yellow and brown region starting to enter the graph. And that represents the PERC cell. So UNSW technology finally hitting the market around 2015, 2016, and then um, completely taking over just in a few short years. So you have to remember as well, this is just showing the proportion of production and the production as shown in one of my earlier graphs is growing exponentially. So this is really a very massive and rapid expansion of PERC production worldwide. And last year, the official figure is that PERC accounted for 91.2% of uh, total world production. So we're very proud of that uh, figure. 
Well, getting back to this uh, cost reduction, you can see this graph here with the 24 times reduction in 12 years, really very dramatic. So from 2016 on, that cost reduction can be attributed to the uptake of PERC technology, that transition that you see there. The PERC cells are more efficient and uh, are cheaper to produce, and uh, we'll see some of the other benefits very shortly. But the really important um, drops in cost at the beginning of those curves there, we also played a role in that through um, people we had trained. So the gentleman in the foreground there is my 12th PhD student, Dr. Zhengrong Shi, uh, born in China, but now an Australian citizen. And um, he was fired with the ambition uh, at around the turn of the century to set up a manufacturing line somewhere in the world. And he chose China as the location, which was a very brave choice because China then had no commercial cell manufacturing operations. So he, in 2002, he got his first production line working in China. So this was the first commercial cell production in China. And there was just no infrastructure for doing that and not much expertise in the company, in the country at that stage. So a lot of people from our lab, some left our lab and joined him. You can see three of the people in the photo below who played a major role. The guy in the middle set up all the equipment and so on. The guy on the left, um, uh, set up all the processing in in China on the production lines, and the guy on the right was the was the guy in charge of keeping the production lines running there. And they had all been trained in our laboratory. I did some of the harder work, cutting ribbons and that kind of thing. <laughs> also um, helping uh, Zheng Rong get uh, support from local governments and things in building up the supply chain for production in China. So initially all his materials and things had to be imported, but he could see that there would be an advantage in setting up the whole supply chain of materials and equipment that he needed within China. And I played a bit of a role in doing that. Uh, and then the really big thing that happened was in 2004, he was approached by US investment banks, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, some of the big names in that, uh, US investment bank industry, encouraging him to do a management buyout. So they provide him with the cash to buy out his original Chinese investors, replace them with a lot of uh, investors that were better known internationally. And Suntech, the company that my students founded, became the first private Chinese company to list on the New York Stock Exchange in 2005. And the photo up the top on the left there is that listing. I got to help him ring the bell, as did my wife, uh, Judy, who's also in the photo and came here for the award presentation as well. So that uh, really opened the floodgates. So the chart on the right just sort of shows investment into the Chinese photovoltaic industry through the listings that followed on the exchange. So you can see SunTech, you know, the first one, it took about a year before other companies could get themselves into the position they needed to be to have a viable chance of listing. But um, there was a, uh, a flood of companies that listed uh, on the US exchanges, uh, the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, and uh, that injected about seven billion into these companies over a very short period. So these were all small, privately owned companies in China that grew overnight from small companies to billion dollar type operations through these listings. Um, so nine um, Chinese companies, you can see some of the listings here. The people circled are my former students. Uh, the listing companies had to show access to good technology and uh, my students were grabbed to uh, fill senior technical roles in these companies to provide that due diligence, to meet that due diligence criteria for these investment companies. So that's uh, how the industry got started in China. Not many people know this story and there's an alternative version of reality that floats around, but this is what uh, really happened. Um, and uh, nine companies floated on the US exchanges between 2005 and the global financial crisis in 2008. And six of those nine are still within the top 10 solar manufacturers worldwide. So this is what, uh, what did it. 
Well, back to the PERC. Um, the PERC has been responsible for the recent cost reductions. And, um, you know, one of the reasons for that is it offers not only higher performance, but more functionality. So it's easy to make cells that respond to light from both directions. And uh, the photo on the left there just sort of shows why that might be useful. You still get a lot of light hitting the rear side of the module. You point the front side, side more or less in the direction of the sun, but you still get a lot on the rear side. So you can boost the output of the module at very little extra cost. And, um, and the other thing you can see is the cells are no longer square, they're rectangle. And we sort of pioneered this approach. We teamed up with some uh, Japanese companies for solar car racing in the 1990s, and this was a very important, important source of income for our laboratory, was selling uh, solar cells to teams like Honda for this solar car racing. And this is the most beautiful array we made for Honda in 1996, and they set a new race record using the PERC cells. This was, in fact, the first commercial sales of PERC back in 1996. And we did things like used rectangular cells because that gave you better performance and packed the cells very closely. In fact, we overlapped them, we shingled them. And both those ideas have very recently taken off in the um, mainstream industry as well um, with the uptake of PERC. Uh, so that just sort of shows singling on the left, you overlap the cells, or there's various other approaches that have been introduced to reduce the dead space between the cells. And uh, the, on the right there, you can see a module. The darker version is the version looking from the front, and the blue version is looking from the back. So it don't, don't look a lot different, but the, the front is actually slightly more efficient than the rear. Uh, by cutting the cells up, it's uh, opened a new avenue for cost reduction. So uh, in the past, the cells were about 15 centimetres squared. And the reason for that was that generated about 10 amps of current. And um, having a cell generate more current than that was a bit of a problem in that to carry large amounts of current, you need very thick copper conductors and things, and that starts costing money. So people thought, well, six inch or 15 centimetres was pretty good size, pretty good trade-off between the cost of manufacturing the cell and the cost of the copy, cop, copper you needed to uh, use it. But then with the introduction of PERC and people chopping cells into halves and so on, it's allowed the industry to go to much bigger wafers. So now they're going to 210 millimetre square wafers or eight inch in the uh, imperial units. And um, that allows you to fabricate the cells more cheaply and then you chop them up into smaller bits at the end of the processing. So that just gives you an idea. So all that's happened over about a, a three year period um, with the uptake of PERC. So this just compares what's happened in microelectronics. So the red, the red, the yellow circles show the progress in the um, microelectronic wafer size as a function of time, timeline across the bottom and the blue shows the size of the wafers used in solar manufacturing. So now we've caught up with microelectronics. So microelectronics uses a 300 millimeter diameter wafer and that's the size that these 210 wafers, square wafers be cut out of. So microelectronics was planning to go to bigger and bigger wafers but sort of got stuck on the 300 millimeter wafers because the cost of the photographic processes that you need in microelectronics didn't scale with wafer size as, uh, as well as had been anticipated when this slide was made. So by now, we should be up to 670 millimeter wafer sizes if this sort of roadmap shown here had have, um, been followed. Um, but uh, because solar cells don't really use photolithography or the photographic processes, there's no reason that solar can't go to these bigger and bigger wafer sizes. So we might see that happening in the future. So the size of the packages, the modules has been growing. So some of them are now uh, eight foot tall, 2.4 meters tall, so getting uh, very large. So the size of the module at the moment is determined by how much two people can conveniently carry. So 40 kilograms is about the limit that two people can comfortably lug around all day. So uh, modules are being kept to a size that keeps their weight less than that as shown there. So this is a module using PERC cells that weighs about 30 kilo um, size. 
But um, for earlier versions of uh, different type of technology, you know, larger modules were actually manufactured around 2010, and they were too heavy for two people to carry. So there was um, effort put in developing equipment for installing modules. So you know, this is one way the industry will, will, might evolve. So I guess what I'm saying is that even though solar cells have been around the efficient version of them since 1954, the industry in commercial terms is a very early stage of development and there's a lot of development both in the cell manufacturing and in the installation and use of the solar that still has to be fully realised. So the thinking is that what will determine the biggest size module you can use is how many, what you can fit into a 40-foot container, which is the main way of transporting them both around the world and around the countryside. So a question, a big question is, you know, the, the technology has evolved and um, the industry is now dominated by our university's perk cell technology. What might happen after that? And it, it turns out that um, solar cells respond to photons in sunlight. So um, Albert Einstein was the first to realise that you could regard sunlight as being made of photons, as I explained before. But... Um, the colour of the photon doesn't really matter to a solar cell. As long as it's got a energy over a certain threshold, it doesn't matter if it's a high-energy photon, like the blue or ultraviolet ones that give you sunburn, or a lower-energy one down the red end of the spectrum. It's just the number of photons that count. But, um, you know, so it's sort of an inefficient use of photons in a certain respect, and why the limit for a silicon cell is 29% rather than you know, 69% or something like that. But if you stack cells made from different semiconductors on top of a silicon cell, you can address that issue. You can design the cells that you stack so that they can convert the higher energy photons better than silicon can do. So you sort of get an automatic filtering effect shown there on the right. The sunlight um, hits the cell stack and the high energy photons get absorbed by the semiconductor material that's designed to use them. And then the lower energy photons pass through to the next uh, highest threshold cell and it uses the photons it can use and then the lower energy ones pass through to the bottom. So that's called a tandem cell stack. And um, that's one way of uh, using the photon energy in sunlight better. So the efficiency limit for a stack of cells like that does go up to 68.2% compared to the 29% for a silicon cell, so that you do get you know, sort of a more reasonable type of sounding figure for the efficiency. You're only converting sunlight that would otherwise be wasted, so it, it really only matters in terms of the cost of installing and transporting the panels and all this kind of thing is where the um, advantages from this improved efficiency comes, but going to be increasingly important as the cells become cheaper. So um, a tandem cell stack. The graph on the right just shows the efficiency improvement you can get. And silicon's a very good choice for the bottom cell in the stack. So the, the, the green regions in those charts just show the efficiency for cell stack based on silicon. So 29% for a single silicon cell, 33% if you had your choice of ideal materials. So silicon's not a bad choice, but if you start stacking cells on silicon, of two cells stack, you get up to 42.5% uh, efficiency. So very close to the best you could possibly do and a three cell stack similarly. So stacking you know, two or three cells onto silicon, you can push the efficiency along. And that's what we'll see, I think, probably um, early next decade, we'll see two and three cell stacks on silicon. And then um, each time you stack a cell, the photons get shared. The blue photons that would originally have gone to silicon go to one of these upper cells in the stack. So the silicon no longer sees them. So the amount of photons, the silicon cells, gets divided by the number of cells in the stack. So the contribution to the overall performance becomes less and less. So once you go to a three cell stack, I think the industry will go to a all thin film technology. You'll get away from the use of silicon wafers and just deposit thin films of these semiconductor materials onto glass. So that's my prognosis for what the technology will look like in the middle of this century. You'll have four or six cells of thin film material stacked on top of one another. 
So that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, one thing that's going to happen with solar cells, we've seen that massive 24 times cost reduction over the 12 years between 2008 and 2020, but the cost reduction hasn't finished. There's still plenty more cost reduction to come. And so that um, we're going to see solar cells, you know, they're already the cheapest way of generating bulk electricity is using the solar, but we're going to see them become very much cheaper in the future. So insanely cheap. And people talk about, you know, the third energy revolution where you've got this abundant cheap solar energy available from the cheap solar cells that we're going to see over the next decade. So new technology, and PERC is a perfect example, uh, accelerates the rate of cost reduction. So I showed on one chart how PERC had reduced the costs since 2016. So all these technologies competing against each other is really good. There's a lot of technology in the pipeline and battling to gain commercial supremacy will accelerate cost reductions. So um, this mightn't mean too much to a general audience, but modules um, used to be, you might remember back to one of my graphs, used to be $4 a watt, but I think we'll see 10 cents a watt, so 40 times cheaper sometimes over this decade. Coronavirus has slowed things down a little bit, but um, definitely over this decade. And uh, one cent per kilowatt hour electricity prices. So I guess that's one yen per kilowatt hour electricity prices. And actually there was a bid in um, uh, Saudi Arabia in 2021 for one cent. The company supplying the electricity uh, undertook to supply it for one cent a kilowatt hour. So I'm not sure how much people listening are paying for their electricity, but I'm paying more like um, 30 yen a kilowatt hour for mine. So one cent is really very cheap. And solar will play a major role in mitigating global warming. It along with wind, um, storage, battery storage and pumped hydro storage, I think, and, and maybe uh, hydrogen uh, generation using solar and wind to generate the hydrogen are the best weapons that we have uh, in mitigating uh, climate change. So, you know, we've been very dependent upon political issues, but they haven't been all that effective. But now that solar in particular is cheaper than any other way of generating electricity and batteries are becoming progressively cheaper and so on, I think uh, we're in a very good position to see solar uptake, putting us on the right kind of trajectory, as I explained before, to can keep temperature rise globally to a reasonable level. So uh, thank you very much for listening to the talk. Uh, again, I'm uh, very honoured to have received the 2021 Japan Prize and I thank all those involved for the luster and the honour of that award. Thank you.